My name is Cindy Deardorff, and I'm a member of the Historical Society, so many of you know me. Um, I'm a historical reenactor, which means I portray somebody in history, and I share this information at, like, if you've been to the Feast of the Hunter's Moon, Battle of Missinewa, 1812, and I talk about Native lifeways. Um, I was interested in archaeology as a child. My mom would take me to all these sites. She was me a member of the archaeology group that was here in Coutts there for a while, the Northwest Indiana Archaeology Society. And I just kind of kept going and going. And then when I graduated from college, I started volunteering at Bailey Homestead. And then I joined other groups. And so it's evolved. 20 years later, I'm up here giving my own program. So with that, um, I developed an interest in gardening. Now as a kid, mom gave me those garden chores, pull the weeds, clean the spinach, and I would pout, I would stomp. I hated that. Today, I enjoy every part that I have learned from my mom, my grandmother, my grandfather. And so when I went to these places, they were talking about colonial foods, British foods, French foods, and nobody was talking about the Native American foods or how they raised it. So then I decided, well, I'm going to combine all these things that I like to do into one. And like I said, it has nothing to do with my college degree. I'm a tax accountant. <laughs> so totally opposite, right? <laughs> so let's get started. This is a picture of a garden that I was able to do for Buckley Homestead 2006. And I was really proud of that because everything that you see here was totally Native American heirlooms. Everything grew for me. And um, it was just an overall success, okay? And we'll get back to, this is sort of the end where I'm really proud of it. And as the slides go forward, we'll show you the beginning and then where we end up back to this picture again. Okay, Native American garden or another term, the three sisters. Basically, we have maize, that was the native term. We called it corn, the early Europeans, and there was beans, and then there was squash. And again, now this is a picture of a native garden that was done at Isla Kosh Museum in Romeoville, um, Illinois. I was just there for an event. Um, I did not participate in this garden, but I sent them the research and, whoops, all those plants there that you see are my heirloom seeds that I have raised and uh, given out, protected all these years. So what is a Three Sisters Garden? Well, it's a very old method of garden by the native people that uses a system of combining these plants, growing them in one area, sometimes as small as only 12 inches wide, to rows that could be 20 acres, okay? And what's interesting, even though the native people probably did not know the genetics or the scientific reason why these plants grew well together, which we know today, they found this out probably from experimenting or whatever, but they found out that corn, beans, and squash just grew in harmony with each other. You have the corn, which provides a stalk. And if you plant the beans next to that corn, if, especially if it's a pole bean, it's going to roam over that stalk and attach itself. And then the, and the roots are going to provide nitrogen for the corn. The squash is going to come around that hill and grow and provide shade, maintain the moisture in that hill, and prevent animals who don't like those prickly squash leaves away from the corn and the beans. So as the native people believe, corn is the first sister. Um, the squash is the next sister. I apologize for some of the pictures. Um, the projector is kind of really brightening up, them up. So if you can't see something very clear, it is the projector. Um, 
So as we go forward, maybe they'll be a little bit better. And the beans are the three, third sister. And again, it's basically what I had said earlier. So here's a, like a drawing, and you can see a little bit better. Here's this hill, okay? And the smallest one that I have recorded is about 12 inches. The largest one could be 36 to 48 inches wide, a hill. And then you're going to see, here's the beans, and then the uh, corn itself. And now we have, and this, now this picture here is in Michigan City at the Friendship Gardens. And again, um, these are my heirloom seeds, but um, the ranger there, um, Jude, uh, is the one who planted the garden. So the native people have stories. They like to explain why things work for them through their stories. They don't have a written language, and so they have oral stories. So I'll let you have a little bit of time to read this. Um, it was said that the earth began when Sky Woman, who lived in the upper world, peered through a hole in the sky and fell into the sea. The animals saw her coming, so they took the soil from the bottom of the sea and put it on the back of the giant turtle to provide a safe place for her to land. And this is called Turtle Island, and this is called North America. And you will find several, several stories concerning Turtle Island or North America. Sky Woman was said to become pregnant as she fell. And when she landed, she gave birth to a daughter. Her daughter grew into a young woman and she also became pregnant. She died while giving birth to twin boys. Sky Woman buried her daughter in the new earth, and from her grave grew three sacred plants, corn, beans, and squash. These plants provide food for her sons and later for all humanity. These special gifts ensure the survival of the Iroquois people. Another story, and this is from the Great Lakes area, the great spirit came to the earth in the form of a woman, and she fell asleep. When she awoke and walked through the land, there were useful plants that sprang up around her. At the right and at the left appeared beans, pumpkin, maize. They came from her footprints, and from the place where she slept grew tobacco. And you're going to find these stories within all the regional groups. Oh boy, this is not as good as I would have liked this picture, but that's okay. Um, this is early observations. Um, hold on one moment. Sorry about that. Oops. Okay. Um, this is a very old documentation or print from the Incas. A lot of the Jesuits, um, a lot of the priests that came with the Spanish explorers documented what they saw. Okay, so I'm going to try to point out some things from this manuscript that is found in Copenhagen. And this is from the 1500s and it's from the Incas. You'll see here, here's the men, okay, and here's their foot plows, or as we call digging sticks. Here is probably the medicine person or the uh, religious person who's probably saying a prayer. And here are the women who are planting the seeds. And here's another picture here. You can see here's the digging stick. Here's her seeds. And this person here is probably getting ready maybe to cover those seeds with this instrument. Here's another picture, and this is from Peru. Again, here's the irrigation. Now, we do know in Peru they had um, several canals. Okay, and then here they're weeding. And this is something you're going to see from generation to generation, from group to group. They had watchers, people who stayed or lived at the garden, and they would either make noise or scream or, you know, whatever it took to chase all the animals away or all the varmints to keep their crops. Okay. Yes? I wonder if you turned the light off completely. Does it show 
No, I don't need the light. Does that work? Does that work better? Okay. Now here is another picture. Again, these are pictures from the 1500s. This is, was documented. Here you can see the corn. I'm going to say this is the corn. Here you're going to see the varmint or the deer or the llama or whatever. And here's the man who's harvesting his crop. And here's the watcher. He's got his fire built. And he's scaring, he's clapping. But obviously it's not getting rid of this animal here. And then here you're going to see the harvest. Here they have the corn. And they're harvesting there. And this is from Peru. How did you get these pictures? Um, Lots of research and just all of a sudden I got a hold of a book that uh, was in the library book sale table, wow. History of Corn, and um, these slides were in that book. Are these replicas of what? Yeah, they, I, I took a scan. I, huh? Did they come from in caves or something? No, these are, the priests wrote these, this stuff down in their journals. This is recorded, this is recording drawings from their journals or manuscripts. And the originals, a lot of them are found in Europe. Oh, this is really bad. Sorry about that. Um, this is the Florentine Codex, which is from 1743. And again, as long as I know you can't really see this, this is the digging stick and the gentleman is planting his corn. This is the corn. Um, I don't know if you could see right there, you can maybe come up later and we'll, if there's some slides that you want to re-see, see, we'll um, look at them on the computer. Um, again, here's the harvest and here they're storing into vessels. Um, here is another description, 1586 in the West Indies, after Columbus discovered the islands. Um, this is very interesting. The gentleman who was observing this said that if this gentleman did not come in to, he was working hard to bring in his cross because he wanted to please his fiance. And he needed sufficient feed to feed his wife and children. So he must be busy if he's got a fiance and a wife and children. <laughs> Oops. Okay. Um, early explorers, um, painters uh, came into Florida. Here we have a picture in 1564. Again, you have rows of crops being planted. The women, she probably has her seeds there. Here she's got a digging stick. Now here you have a gentleman, and I'm going to assume the way they are working, they're clearing the land. Okay, and this is an engraving. Um, there is a book where these pictures are all located at. And this one's a terrible picture, and we, we worked with the projector and we weren't getting these very well. Um, this is an Iroquois village. Um, here's all the dwellings, the longhouses. You're going to see fields. This is fields of corn, beans, squash. Um, here's corn. Um, when you look at the documentation, it seems like every family member had small, their personal gardens. And then there was the community fields. And this is where you're going to get acres of uh, corn, uh, corn and beans. Um, again, this is another first printed illustration of maize, reproduced from 1542. Um, corn wasn't always just one stalk. And in fact, when you raise heirloom corn, sometimes you'll get two or three stalks. So there's a stalk here, there's a stalk there, a stalk there, and a stalk there. Now, it could be possibly the corn had two or more stalks, or 
you're going to have four or five seeds in one hole in this mound. More than likely, it's the four or five seeds planted together to produce all these. So that way, actually, it pollinates very well that way. Does maize have ears? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Maize is an Indian name for corn. And, and so, so what we call maize now that they grow for feed. Corn is basically corn maize. It's an interchangeable name. Um, and I wish this picture had turned out because you're going to see here fossil, fossil remains of corn. Um, and then here is an early drawing from another from the 1500s. And this just didn't turn out at all compared to what's on the computer. <laughs> Yep, this is the next one, okay. Um, here is some early vessels that talk about corn. Um, and again, corn was sacred to the native people, so um, they also created works of art showing the corn. You have squash, where again, they uh, created works of art. Um, here again, they also made stone works. This is carved um, stone of the primitive corns. And here, I found this old drawing. Um, I got it off of eBay. Somebody had taken apart a book, which sometimes I don't like, but. Um, Anyway, in 1837, they were drawing corn, and here's tobacco, and here's the flowers. And I have it hanging in my wall. <laughs> um, and again, here we have another picture. These are rock drawings in the southwest. And again, if you can see, there's the corn plant that's been engraved into the stones. This is another corn. Um, and here is a man drawing in corn. These are out in New Mexico. Um, again, we have vases, again, from the Southwest that shows the corn in their art. Okay, um, before I go on to this one, I'm going to read just a couple of things, observations, uh, some of the things that are local, okay? And I'm gonna start with the year 1812, um, I last year participated in the 200th anniversary of the Battle of Tippecanoe. And General Harrison has in his diary, after the battle, I ordered the troops to burn down Prophetstown and destroy all the Native American cooking implements. After everything was confiscated, we totaled up 5,000 bushels of corn and beans. Now, if you think 5,000 bushels of corn and beans, that wasn't a small garden by any means. You're talking down at Lafayette fields along the Wabash River planted of corn and beans and squash. In 1790, General Anthony Wayne of Fort Wayne Never have I ever beheld such immense fields of corn in any part of America from Canada to Florida. And that's around the Fort Wayne area. In 1786, William Burnett, a St. Joseph trader with the Potawatomis, and that was the Native American group in Northwest Indiana, requested a boat to come from Fort Mackinac to pick up 220 bushels of corn from his St. Joseph post along the St. Joseph River. Um, 1722, Marquette, who was a Jesuit from Upper Lake Michigan, speaking on the Illinois Indians, in addition to maize, they plant beans and melons, which are very excellent, especially those with a red seed. They dry their squashes in the sun to eat in the winter and the spring. So I have 
several of these documentations where again in 1663 a captive said their beans were of many colors. They had white beans, black beans, red beans, yellow beans, blue, spotted, and a kidney bean. The explorer Champagne recorded they grow a quantity of Indian corn. They plant squashes and sunflowers for which the seed they make the oil for which they anoint their head. Hair conditioner. So, um, oh, what's this? I think we better get rid of this, huh? <laughs> okay. Um, I probably have 200 books and magazines and print offs and, and this is just some of my observations that I have put down. So like they said, they had sunflowers, they planted tobacco, sunchokes. If anybody knows what sunchokes are, Jerusalem artichokes. Uh, Indian potato was another name. They grew watermelons. Now you're thinking watermelons, is that really native? The Spanish being that they came over as early as the 1500s from Florida to when Marquette recorded the melon that he ate in 1700s. You have 200 years where the melon was introduced by the Spanish in Florida all the way up to the Great Lakes already. Um, pumpkins, of course, um, the native people had. Pumpkins and squash is interchangeable. And they also had raised gourds for containers. And another bad um, copy. Um, anyway, this is, if you were to do your own garden here, um, you're going to see mounds. There's one mound, too. And you're going to put corn, and you're going to put beans. Um, around here is the sunflowers. Oh, there's the sunflowers. Um, some beans along trellises. You're going to have side. Since you can't see this too well, I don't know if I'll really talk about it as much as I'll go on to the other things. So um, I recently, in a couple of weeks ago in May, I went up, I had a chance to do a conference with the Potawatomi Indians at Gun Lake Reservation up there where the native people taught us exactly how they do things and we got to plant a garden. One of the things that I learned is that they provide teas and they pre-soak their seeds. And again, in Michigan, they don't have as long as of, of a growing season as we do here. So they have these teas made from white pine needles, um, sweet flag, um, which is bitter root. And it helps the corn to germinate. It's a natural pesticide. And um, here it shows you how to make the tea. You soak the corn overnight and you plant the next day. Generations of knowledge when you say, well, how long did you know how to do this? Well, grandma, great grandma, probably great. This is something that they developed up in Michigan that helps their corn. I try to make this program a little bit of fun, not too dry, so I'm hoping I'm not too dry here. Um, and again, now we're going to the beginning. This is what I planted at Buckley Homestead. Um, here's my hills, okay, which this was clay soil. Um, to use those tools was almost nearly impossible, but we did it. We did it. If anybody has any questions, let me know. Um, maybe. Did, did women do all the planning, or is the men or the combination? Of the you know, it's, it's kind of interesting because every tradition you hear, it's the women, and from all the documentation, it's women. But then when you saw in the earlier pictures, it looked like men were doing it. Um, I discovered that some of the early Jesuits and some of the early explorers did not want to admit 
that all the women were doing this much work because in Europe, men did all this. So in some cases, you're seeing pictures of men. It was actually the women doing it. But the men basically cleared. I mean, they, they would set fires to clear the landscape. They would remove the trees, and they would maybe do the initial tilling, you know, with the, the digging sticks and stuff, and then it was all turned over to the women and the children, the young girls, and the, the, the traditional family. So here's a close-up of my corn hill, and you can see that, and again, this is another way that I was taught, is for this size of a hill, I planted four kernels of of corn in separate um, areas, one to the north, east, west, and south for the four directions. And I planted, I let this germinate and come up about five, six inches, and then I, I planted uh, one bean to this particular here, and here's my tool, which I used to scrape up all the bark and everything in the soil to make a hill. And here later on, as the garden grew, um, here's the squash trying, trying to meander. Um, here's the beans that are growing onto the stalk. Here's another bean. Oops. Oh boy, these pictures aren't very good. Um, what does the archaeology tell us? Well, um, in Wisconsin, there are surviving uh, gardens. Uh, it was well protected. It was discovered because it was in a woods. And so you see the trees are growing right into the row. And this is going back 1,000 years, they estimated. Right here's a row, there's a row. They were undisturbed. This is a protected property. You cannot go see it because um, uh, it's one of the few remaining ones. And here is another one in Wisconsin. This one I believe you can go see. Um, it's very hard to see, but there's a hill. There's a hill. Uh, there's a hill with a tree on it. There's a hill. And back there's a hill. They're just rounded mounds. Um, this is a satellite picture. I don't think the next, well, this one's a little bit better. This is in Iowa. And again, the satellite, this is a regular type field that wasn't really um, modern, didn't have any modern farming on it. So again, even though this is grass, you're seeing the mounds, the rows of the ancient field. And here, this picture was taken in 1920 out east in Massachusetts where the hills were still surviving. So here's all the hills. And again, these are in parks, protected. Now this is what I find very interesting, and these have all been destroyed. In Michigan, um, around the Kalamazoo area, a researcher, her name was Bella Hubbard, in 1870s, went around and drew the last remaining cornfields the garden fields that were left by the native people after um, the removal which happened in the 1830s. And so before modern farming destroyed all of them, she did her um, dissertation um, in front of a historic society and she's about the only one that we have record of recording these ancient gardens. And again you're going to see something very unusual. Whoops. Um, here we have circular mounds along with the parallel. And here is such a crisscross. Um, we're f my feeling is that this was part of irrigation. That way the water flowed into the different areas after the rain. And so as it moved and stuff, it, that's my feeling. That's the only reason I can figure out the different um, different layouts. Maybe a different family owned this plot and the family owned this plot and maybe somebody also worked that. This is Grand River Valley, St. Joseph River Valley. Here we have another one which is circular and from this 
A lot of people will talk about the medicine wheel garden. And again, another very long field. So now, what are the tools? Um, I'll invite you up to look at the, some of the tools here I had reproduced. But here's some of the drawings. This is the digging stick. Um, so you know it's not very complicated whatsoever. It's just a simple stick. And, but if you have soil that you haven't really plowed or run the tiller, and again, another reason for this is the native people feel that when you run a plow, run a tiller, you're tearing open the mother earth and she's bleeding. She's in sorrow because of the pain of opening her up. So they don't want to do that. So they use minimum ways of gathering the soil. And technically, you don't need a lot of soil to do your initial mound. So as you keep making mounds, you keep you know, getting your soil together. And here is another, uh, the bison hole, where you know, the shoulder blade of the buffalo is used as a hole. Uh, clamshells. Uh, clamshells can be very, very sturdy. Now, are these tools foolproof? No, they might have gone through tools quite a bit. Um, a bad picture again, I apologize. But this is an actual buffalo uh, shoulder bone hole that was found in Indiana along the Buffalo Trace along Vincennes, Indiana. And here is some stone holes that were found in Indiana also. Um, life around the garden. Again, earlier, you know, when the, in Peru and the Incas and stuff, we saw the watchtowers. Well, this method was also here in northern uh, America. This is typical Iroquois, where they built the watchtower. Um, another one, and here's the garden. And life around included children playing in the garden, making noise, playing games, because all this noise and all this business would keep animals away. That's my little watchtower. <laughs> I put that out at Buckley Homestead because uh, we couldn't get it raised up, but you know, when you're interpreting something, I put a little watchtower together, which was sticks of willow and a little, and that was my little shady spot, and I stored my tools in there. And at one point, I put a little fire there in my little camp. Um, it's at the Woodland Indian Camp, back behind the log cabin. There was a trail. I don't think the garden is going right now. Um, but yeah, I was back, and there's a Woodland Indian camp back there. Um, this is a wonderful story. Um, this is Buffalo Bird Woman. Um, and in 1910, a missionary, Gilbert Wilson, went out to the Arikaras and the Mandan Indians to you know, do his mission work. And he found the women still using the old tools, even though they were given sharp implements like metal hoes and everything, they still um, preferred using sticks, bones, and I know you can't see this, but there's a deer antler right here at the edge of hers. Um, all these women were still using the old way, and if you read her book, there is a book, Buffalo Bird Woman, um, she had preference. This is how her mother taught. Her grandmother taught her mother, and this was just the way she preferred to do her garden. Um, her digging stick um, is right there. They're gathering sunflowers in the old-fashioned baskets. Um, how far back in history does corn, beans, and squash go? In some cases, B.C., in some cases, A.D., Depending on the archaeology data uh, on the sites, every site could be a little different. Um, I just have a couple little dates there. Um, Southwest is a little bit different than around the Great Lakes, a little different around the East Coast. Types of corn that were raised. We have flint corn, flour corn, dent, popcorn, and sweet. 
and all kind of used differently than what we think of corn today. Uh, sweet corn really did not come until the 1700s. And actually, and I will pass, and you're more than welcome to come up and look. Um, sweet corn was a genetic little kernel that came from flint corn. This cob here shows flint and sweet corn both together, not purposely crossed. This corn is called Pucker's corn. It's Iroquois, still raised today. And some cobs will be completely sweet and some will still have the flint corn, but sweet corn comes from this flint corn. Um, popcorn, now you're thinking, you know, we're popping for the, you know, our snack and everything. Um, popcorn mostly was ground into a flour. Sometimes it was popped and they made popcorn soup. They made popcorn mush. They mixed water with it and the older people who didn't have teeth the babies who were going from the mother's milk to food were eating this popcorn mush because it had all the nutrients. Dent corn, the flour corn was grounded basically like wheat flour, it's a softer. The flint corn was roasted, parched, made hominy with it. And here is a close-up, and I'm glad these pictures are getting better. This is corn's ancestor, uh, Tiacinte. And I do believe, yes, here, well, I think everybody can see this. Um, we'll pass that around. Um, the little kernels look like teeth, as you can see right here. And what's interesting is Tiacinte looks pretty much like a corn gone wild. Because um, here's modern corn and here's Tiacinte. The difference here is, of course, the size, but Tiacinte is grass, corn is grass, there is no cob. There's just a little husk material, and if you open that husk material, the kernels all just fall to the ground. Okay? Whereas modern corn, of course, has your cob. Here's another, uh, here's the Tiacinte. And this is how it looks in the husk. They just kind of sit like teeth right on top of each other. And what was that used for? Um, again, you can grind it into a little flour. Um, it does pop a little bit, not like you think of popcorn. It just kind of opens up. And here is an 1836 drawing of the uh, tassel of Tiacinte. And here is another little close-up of the husk material. Um, pod corn. Another early variation of corn. Uh, my friend who gave me the uh, pod corn calls this grandmother's corn or 13 generations corn. 13 generations ago, the great creator gave this corn to the native people. Uh, what's different about it is you're going to now see a cob and you're going to see each kernel wrapped in a husk. Again, when it was processed, it pops like popcorn, but they would put it in a mortar and they would pound everything together, the cob, the corn, and then they would pour water in this mortar and all that husky material would float to the top. Or if they just put the whole mixture and boiled it, all that stuff just disintegrates. So it became part of the meal. Um, here is a very ancient um, stone carving of popcorn down in Peru. So it goes way, way back for documentation. Here is a drawing, again, of popcorn in the 1800s. And now we have beans. Again, some of the European names came over because they looked very familiar. Um, we have the old world beans, were, which were broad beans, lentils and soybeans, and then our new world beans, our common beans, lima beans, and runner beans. And a lot of the foods you'll find were at one time gathered in the wild before they were domesticated. And again, here is a jar of what wild beans 
look like, and they, you can still find them in the woods and everything. What's interesting about wild beans is they weren't so much harvested for the seeds at this point as much as the tubers under the ground. Another name for wild beans is ground nuts. And so you're actually here going to harvest more of the tubers under the ground than you are the seeds. Um, summer squashes, most of them were native. The winter squashes, this is all types. Uh, the zucchini, again, it was called a green marl. It went to Europe, it was named the zucchini. Came back and you're growing that in your garden. Wild uh, squash. I don't have any seeds from wild squash, but I do have wild uh, gourds. And again, in, down in the Texas area and stuff, you're going to find wild squashes growing in the wild along the uh, roadsides. And they say that it's not very edible. The seeds were eaten more than the, the flesh of the squashes. This, this is gourd. This is. I mean, this is a gourd. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. And the wild gourds were called buffalo gourds. And again, the seeds were eaten. No, nothing. It just, they just kind of threw it to the side. Um, and again, I've got the word edible here because not everybody eats their pumpkin flowers. Some, they make an excellent fritter. But there's another use for uh, pumpkin flowers. Um, if you dry them and you tear them all into little pieces and you put them in your stew, it actually thickens and adds flavor to your stew. And again, I tried this. Pumpkins, very young, were ate, eaten just like zucchini at the young stage. You could take that young pumpkin, slice it up, and fry it in cornmeal, fry it with garlic and onion. Um, a little bit of a different texture than we're used to. The taste wasn't too bad. I still prefer zucchini. Mm -hmm. But it was done a lot of times because if you think about the hard winters and stuff, like right now, this is June. This is called the berry month. So they're going to be collecting the wild strawberries, the wild raspberries, blackberries, blueberries. The gardens are being planted, but there's nothing coming food-wise from the garden. So as soon as there's food available, they're going to start eating from that garden as soon as they can. And again, some of the oldest summer varieties that are documented is the white patty pans. And it's kind of a shame that these are not in the marketplace. They're very tasty. I grow like four or five different kinds of these white patty pans. Um, there is a drawing back in the 1579s of these patty pans. Um, a lot of people are familiar with the yellow crookneck. That's still, you can find that in the market and you can find seeds. Here at Patty Pans, you can get those off of Seed Savers website. If you like summer squashes, I would recommend you try this white patty pan because after that, I just don't go back to the zucchini nearly as much as with this. We have the oldest winter varieties, um, the cheese squashes, again, from paintings in the 1600s. These were um, native. The Kusha is coming from the West Indies. And in the Cohokia Mounds, there is a statue and the vine. And you're going to see the Kusha sitting on the statue. One day I'll find a picture of that. Um, some of the oldest pumpkins is called the Connecticut Field. You find that a lot in the marketplace. This one here dates a little bit earlier than the Connecticut field. And it's not a, it doesn't shape well. It's not a nice round pumpkin. That's how it's come. They don't use this anymore. Um, sometimes it's bumpy. Sometimes it has lines. Sometimes it's round, cylinder. So it lost favor. Sometimes that's what happens to heirlooms. Here, the Arikaras um, in North Dakota, South Dakota, raised this again. It doesn't look pretty, it's kind of bumpy, it's green here, it's orange here, it's pink here. Does it have quite a bit of bulb in it? Yes, it? and it makes a great pumpkin pie. So again, that's kind of the history of heirlooms. Sometimes 
They don't produce a lot. Sometimes a vine will only produce two. We like it to produce a lot. Sometimes we don't like the looks of it. And so we forget how well they taste. And so then, now that we're all worried about the new genetics and stuff like that, these heirlooms are coming back into favor and now you can find the seed sources. Um, this is from my garden. Um, years ago, I was at a reenactment, the Battle of Missinima, and there was a Miami elder. And he had little samples of the Miami white flower corn. This was raised in Indiana. There is documentations galore for it, but you can't, you don't find it commercially. Um, he gave me 12 seeds. 20 years later, I've still got a crop going. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. And then in the years that my dad's growing corn, I can't grow this because I don't want it to cross, so I raise it every other year. Um, again, you'll find documentations where it was traded into the forts and it was never traded into the forts on the cops. It was already grounded up into the flower because the Miamis did not want anybody to have the seeds. The fact that I got this seed as a gift and a lot of my heirlooms, I would go talks, I would just visit with the people. Um, I have a little food display sitting out at my camp. And at one point, I even had a gentleman come up to me. This was about 10 years ago. And he said, I have cancer. I'm not going to survive the year. And he comes with a bag. And I open up this bag, and it's all of his heirloom seeds. He says, I have no children. I want you to raise these. So a lot of my beans came from this gentleman. And I got a hold of his wife, and she gave me some of the documentation where he got the seeds from. But that's how some of my story got going on saving some of these heirlooms. They were gifts, or I was at the right location, and I was just talked about these things, learning, and then I would get samples. Here is the Potawatomi white flower corn. Um, I do have the samples of the Miami and the Potawatomi corn here. Again, it's another. Um, gift and then I lost it and I felt so bad but then I found a seed bank, government seed bank and they give you one chance, one sample, um, Iowa University and there's my little patch growing, and there's my seed. So this is the third year I've maintained this. Um, another um, heirloom is the Seneca Bear if anybody has raised Scarlet Runners, I don't know if anybody's familiar with the Scarlet Runner bee, it has a red flower. So it attracts hummingbirds. Um, and again, a lot of these beans and corn have stories. Bear bean, well, it did come from the Seneca, but it's the shape of the paw of the bear. Or another uh, name for some of these beans, they'll say, this is what it's cooked with. So this is the bean that was cooked with bear, or like bison, or maybe a roast. Uh, so you have a heavy bean with a heavy meat. Um, here's another uh, gift, the Potawatomi Miami uh, bean. I had a friend who went up to Minnesota. She was at a historic garden, got talking to the gardener, and said she wanted to bring the seeds into Indiana. She was going to raise them at a local park and there was just a little bit too much red tape, um, too many critters. Um, so she said, Cindy, would you grow this? And so I've been maintaining this one. This is my first seed. Um, so I've been maintaining it about 15 years now. Here is the Potawatomi rabbit bean. Um, now this one's not a true bean. This is a cow pea. And so the history of this is when the Potawatomis were, were removed from Indiana, some of the Potawatomis went into Texas. Down in Texas, you find cow peas. And so this was a trade item. Again, it was traded right back up into the Great Lakes. So by the 1900s, you're going to find this. And the woman who gave this one to me, I asked the question, OK, why is it named rabbit bean? Cindy, 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 Cindy. I cook rabbits with that. Okay, and so I tried it. I didn't have a rabbit, but I had a squirrel. 
Um, this bean makes a gravy. You just cook it along with the meat and, it, and eventually the bean just disintegrates and you have this wonderful gravy with it. So I'm sure it works with rabbit the same way. Um, the Ohio pole. Again, these are pictures from my garden. This one was grown around Fort Wayne and after the removal period, the Quakers moved in, the Quaker farmers moved in. They found this growing along the roadsides, along their fields. Again, it was maintained by the Quakers from the 1700s. Uh, Potawatomi Lima, this is coming from Michigan. Uh, here's, now this is my whole garden along the side and Judy can vouch how long that garden is. <laughs> she helps me garden. These are all the beans all the way to the roadside. All the different varieties. And there's my dad's field right there. But these are all the different varieties of beans. Because you can grow a lima bean, a runner bean, and certain kind of beans and they won't cross with each other. This is a very tasty lima bean. Once you have this lima bean, it's like a butter bean, you really don't want to eat another lima. They boil up pink and uh, very tasty. Again, the Cherokee pole. Um, this is an interesting uh, bean in that you have yellow beans, green beans, and purple beans. The Cherokee and this variety plant these all together to get the biggest produce the biggest amount because they say if you grow only the black beans, yeah, you get some beans. If you grow only the yellow ones, yeah, some beans. If you grow all three of these colors together, you have a big crop. So Cindy goes and tests it out, you know, she just plants one color. And true, I planted them all together and I had the biggest harvest of beans. It's really fun because you have yellow beans, and purple beans, and green beans. Uh, Cherokee. You're just, growing them. you're just growing them all together and uh, because they ha these beans have crossed at one point it could have been a hundred years ago and the Cherokee just maintain them this way because this is the way they prefer them um, again when the Cherokee went on the trail um, and started living in Oklahoma these were the beans that they were able to take with them that's the name and here's some more pictures of some of the squashes. Here's my little white patty pans, and here's a yellow patty pan. Um, this is a very old zucchini. Uh, it, uh, our modern zucchini is about 1960s, 1950s. This is the early 1900s. Here's my kusha. Here's my Miami pumpkin. Um, and you can see that here's some Miami pumpkin. Again, this was another seed that was given to me by the gentleman who had the cancer. Um, again, a lot of times you'll find a couple of different shapes. Bumpy, uh, with lines in them, not a perfectly shaped pumpkin. Um, the flesh is a deep orange and very tasty. Very tasty. Um, again, when I explained um, Marquette, when with the melon of red seeds. Um, I don't know of too many red seeded watermelons. There is a Hopi red seeded melon in the southwest. Um, I was given to this uh, by a Cherokee gentleman again who has gone on a spirit path, John White from southern Illinois. He gave me this seed I'm trying to maintain. I almost lost and I contacted um, some of the people that I gave the seed to and, and I got it back again. Um, here's my sunflower patch. It's about the length of my barn. Uh, my grandfather started this. Here's a wild sunflower growing in my garden. Men are generally traditionally responsible for the tobacco patches. Now the fact that I have planted this tobacco, it would never be used in a sacred ceremony. That would be the difference. It's not that women couldn't. It depends on what group of natives. But usually the men planted it, the men maintained it, and the, main, the men used it. Um, because I've done this, they would never accept my tobacco for ceremonies or anything like that. And now for food storage. I mean, this is what you're going to see them digging a pit. And you find these pits in the archaeology record. Um, this is basically how it's all put together. And this is in Buffalo Bird Woman's book. Here's her beans some dried squash, corn. This is all underground here. 
You're going to see the grass, you're going to see the earth, the ashes. And there's no guarantee that another human being or another animal is going to prevent finding this and taking the food for themselves. But they did a good job of trying to hide it and everything like that. Um, in the modern times, um, there was a gentleman by Oscar Will who started in the 1920s, I believe, um, some native seeds from the Mandans and the Arikaras. He put together his seed uh, book. This is 1946, where he always drew pictures of the women tending to their garden. Just about every issue had native um, on, on this. And the great northern bean that you make bean soup, that's actually from the Mandan and the Arikara Indians in North Dakota. And it was collected during the Lewis and Clark expedition, besides this gentleman, too. And here in his uh, catalog, um, I got these off of eBay because he gives a history of where he collected and the name of the gentleman in the tribe, Son of a Star, that was the Indian's name, where he collected his source of his seeds. Uh, here's a red bean. and. I grow this Arica yellow. So sometimes I have to go into old catalogs to find the old information on these heirlooms. And I kind of end this with the government celebrating the Three Sisters Garden on their coin. Um, and I collected all those coins because I thought finally the government kind of uh, acknowledged the women, the Three Sisters Garden, and that's the end. So if you have any questions, I mean, you can come up um, and see the actual Miami corn, the Potawatomi corn. Um, this is only a little sample of all the beans. I probably have 125 varieties total. I don't raise them all. Sometimes I just collect them because I'm only maintaining the ones from Indiana or the Potawatomi and the Miamis. Um, I think there's one corn here that I really find interesting because it's green and it's from Mexico. And you really don't see a green corn except that is green. It's very green. So you're more than welcome to come up, look at the tools. Um, I have seeds for sale so if it's not too late to put beans in. Sweet corn you can still put in. I know it's kind of dry, but I do have some seeds. I have a black sweet corn available from the Iroquois. It's, it's this one here. Um, and I have a Potawatomi bean, and I have the Miami squash, if anybody is interested in, in those seeds. How much land do you farm? <laughs> <laughs> How much do you say, Judy? At least an acre? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I have one garden plot that's about the size of a old, the old milk barn, and then I have that one side area that runs across like the whole. The field? No, not quite that. No, 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 no. Well, last year we went down the lane and then planted that. Yeah, that, that one. That one year, yeah, we were down in the back of the. All these are raised at the Walter Deardorff farm <laughs> by the Nutsko Power Plant. <laughs> and. Um, you'll find a little bit of that. Yes, you'll find corn necklaces. Uh, uh, the Cherokee were known to make corn necklaces. Um, some, some corn was raised for sacred ceremonies only. It was never eaten. It was just raised for ceremony. Um, and others, the, the blue corn, the yellow corn, they all had certain meanings. Mm -hmm. Little neck and little holes so the mm -hmm. couldn't get at it. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And here <laughs> I have a seed pot. Oh. Nice clay pot. There's the hole. <laughs> so there's the seeds are inside. And then um, this one here, another clay one. And again, you use the top of the corn. I got the beans in there. Um, little gourds were decorated, kept seeds in. Um, Southern Indiana was known for the river cane. A lot of river cane was uh, used as seed holders. 
Uh, and then some of the women were as elaborate as they twined little bottles out of cordage, plant cordage. Now this is just regular twine, but I've seen hemp, I've seen uh, basswood, I've seen stinging nettle baskets to store their corn. How long are the seeds good for? You talk about heirloom, I would assume some of those went for years without being yeah, some, a lot of heirlooms get lost, but there's always seems to be a native family that each family has their own seeds. Um, last year I got a gentleman who contacted me from Seed Savers who was a Meskwaki Indian out of Iowa. They have a big settlement out in Iowa. I did not realize that there was a reservation in Iowa. Um, and he said that he knew that the Meskwakis had a green and white squash in his family. But that's when they lived in Illinois. And so when um, we contacted, we exchanged pictures. Because I only had one green and white squash at the time. And he goes, I think that's the picture. And so he made a picture of his grandfather raising this squash. And he said, said we think this is the, the Kusha. And so he has that. And now he's brought that back to his reservation. So sometimes I feel very good about doing this. Sometimes my aching back says, oh. and Judy says, oh, Cindy. And then my dad goes, what do you want me to do now? <laughs> um, I'm holding up this piece of bark. Um, can anybody tell me what I would use a piece of bark for? Well, I could do that. Um, actually, just like what we do, if we pre-start our tomatoes and stuff, that corn that's soaked, I'm going to have a little bit of soil and I'm going to put those soaked corn seeds there and that's how I test if it's going to sprout or not. And then if it does sprout, I wait a day or two and I take that little plant and then I'm going to transplant it into the mound. If nothing sprouts, then I know the seed's not good. So this is like my little tester, my little sprouter. Do you have any idea about the history of the sunchokes? Um, there's just, you know, there's books and they mention them all the way back to the 1600s. It's a relative of the sunflower. It's in the sunflower family. They have a little sunflower. Yeah, they have a little sunflower, but they don't put seeds on. And it's also called the Indian potato. Um, my grandfather told me when I asked about these things, because I would eat them, and they're also called the air potato, too. They, they give you... Yes. <laughs> yes, they're very good. They taste kind of like a radish with a bite to them. There's a little bit of a bite. Yeah, and they always put the tubers on from September after a light frost or when it gets cold, and you can eat them all the way till April, May. But as soon as they um, actually sprout the green new plant, I think they taste bad. I don't think they lose that raw, crunchy taste to them. There were a lot of them when I was little that George Bocock apparently had planted them. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And I thought they were all gone. And I see there's some down along the road growing. Mm -hmm. wow. I might want a sample of those to, to compare them. Yeah. Oh, OK. Because um, another native uh, Potawatomi gave me a sample of his sunchokes. And they look different than my sunchokes. So I might come and visit you, Sarah, and see how these sunchokes compare to mine. Because there are different varieties. There's different. Actually, there's some that are red, too. They have red tubers. Do you have any of the old garden seeds catalogs? Um, yes, I collect old seed catalogs because that's how I get some of my information on the heirlooms. I look back from some of the old ones that go on to eBay or, or now some of them are going on to the uh, library sites and stuff and, and they're making copies of old catalogs from the 1800s and stuff and so then you could just be online and read all of them, yeah. And a lot of them you'll find have different names like that Mandan white bean, you know them as the northern, the great yeah. northern. Yeah. Um, there's uh, like here, there's a red kidney bean. Um, to me, it looks like the red bean that you have in the cans today. Um, this is a Lenape bean. We call it, they call it Fisher bean also. F 
famous of the Amish in Pennsylvania. They use this bean just about every day. They're, um, so there's different, and, and we do have, these are cranberry beans. You can find cranberry beans, you, pinto beans. You can find these all in the stores, but these, uh, they got them from the natives to begin with, and a lot of them were renamed. So. I particularly was interested when you said these are the beans that the Indians were permitted to take on the Trail of Tears. Mm -hmm. Because I happened to be bringing a book, uh -huh. The Trail of Tears, which I was going to donate uh -huh. for sale at, the, at our uh -huh. festival. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And it talks a lot about the food that the Indians were. Uh -huh. uh, Anyway, it's very interesting. Yeah, and you'll find out that some of, some of the food was confiscated, but some of the women sewed the beans and the corn seeds in their skirts mm -hmm. to take. And sometimes they hid them in the children's clothes also to provide. There was a very interesting story, because uh, I forget the gentleman's name, but um, the Cherokee that were in North Carolina, you know, they took the seed, of course, there, and then the uh, Cherokees of Oklahoma donated back the seed, and somebody walked the trail back mm -hmm. to North Carolina to bring the seeds. He wanted to rewalk the trail, so he went back on the trail and carried the seed back. So that was very interesting, yeah. And the more you get into heirlooms and some of the history, it's really kind of neat. It, it, it grows on you. <laughs> Um, yeah, because otherwise, you know, I wouldn't have this many varieties. And, and like there's a Shawnee flower corn. It's white and blue. At one time, that obviously, which generation it crossed, nobody knows. But they liked that blue and white look. And so they maintain it with the blue and the white. So, and, and I also have a, a handout, suggested reading. So if anybody's really interested, like the Missouri corn, um, some of the books on the Three Sisters, I have three of them that I highly recommend for reading. And you could probably find them in the library. Thank you for coming. Thank I hope it was interesting. <laughs>